Hi, everybody. We are adding Dr. Trellis. Can you hear me? Getting added, and then I should be able to hear you in just a second. Through. All right. Hi, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Uh, okay, so we have the microphone. The, yeah. No, no, I think it's still. Yeah, I think still, you're good. You're good yeah. like that. That's yeah. Good. You, All right, I mean, Alex. look. You look so holiday. I mean, I always love what you're wearing and every single thing that I see you do. Huh. And the, the first thing that I want to say is thank you. I want everybody in the audience who's already joining to know one of the things that I admire the most about you, and this, this is super similar, you remind me so much of Serena Chen in this way, is that you, you are one of the most ad, active patient advocates as oh. a physician that is in our whole entire field. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, it's a, it, it's no work at all. It's what I love. Mm. It's what I'm passionate about. And I think I'm, I'm very, very blessed to be able to be in a field mm. that I love. You know, yeah. who, because, I mean, who has, you know, not many people are, are fortunate enough to be able to do what they love to do. Right? It's com- that is so true. And mm. then I, I only thought for some reason you had two children. Then I found out today you have five. And you managed to invest so much of your heart into being there for patients outside of office hours by writing and publishing your books, participating in a ton of talks, joining us here. How? Let's start with just your story because you had your own infertility journey that led, you know, that, that probably has had a big impact on how you even practice, I imagine. It, it does. Uh, it does change you. Uh, mm-hmm. irrevocably. When I was a third year medical student, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to, I was in medical school, but I, but I didn't know which field I wanted to go into. So I spent one week on the infertility service through OBGYN. And Alice, uh, I, my life changed forever. So I said, wow. this is what I wanted to do. And then, uh, met my wife the following year in medical school while I was in medical school. And, and unfortunately, a few years into residency, we uh, wanted to try to have a child and had difficulty. Mm-hmm. And that continued for 10 years. Wow. So I, I loved the field of infertility from the beginning. And I, I you know, I, I was saying that I always think about it when I, at the time I was saying, you know, God, I didn't need this to get closer to my patients. But mm-hmm. uh, but it. it you have to learn. Every every part of life is a teaching moment. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it was a waste of time. Right. And so I I really became a better person. Mm. Uh, I I I became more understanding of my patients' plight. I've not only talked the talk, I've walked their walk, mm. and I I realize so much of the devastation of this diagnosis, how it impales a patient. Mm. There's no cure unless you have a baby in your arms. Right. That's it. And no matter how, what I teach my residents and my medical students is that no matter how a patient is seemingly behaving when she comes to the office, if she's upbeat and happy and joking, I said, never let that mm-hmm. fool you. Right. She is crushed internally. Yeah. Because when you're trying to conceive, the whole world is pregnant, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, um, isn't that the truth? Right. Yeah, right. That, mm-hmm. You couldn't have said it better. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you have your faces. What I, what I, my analogy that I describe in my book is that you have your faces pressed up against the windows of families. Mm-hmm. And you're outside the playground fence and you right. can't get in. Right. So Oof. to go through 10 years of infertility, I never forget those years. And I'm exquisitely sensitive to anybody who when we're in a group of people and who doesn't start talking about their children when they do, and if someone's not talking about children, I, I just am tuned in immediately to that person and, and try to change the subject in every way I can because I know there may be an issue there. So yeah. um, we, we adopted our five children. I wish we did it sooner. Ten years is a long time to go through, and I encourage everybody who's on here right now is the one lesson – is that time passes like that, all right? And you want to resolve and rid yourself of this burden as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I wish I adopted sooner. 
Mm. But if I but if I did, I wouldn't know my little angels that I have right now. Right. So, That's how I feel about my son who's donor conceived. You know, you have these moments in life, right? I had cancer. I had five days to pick a sperm donor. And I think had I been diagnosed three months later, would that exact sperm donor have been available? So, so you know, like the perfect human that's in front of me that, that, that I love so deeply that I only got to have, you know, and, and had I not even had cancer, would I have waited too long to preserve my fertility and then not been a mom? You know, would age-related infertility have caught up to me? I mean, there's so many things like that where I feel so grateful for such – a difficult, you know, situation for the same reason, because I have my exact angel because of it. Well, I think it, it, it speaks to the fact, Alice, is that you took advantage of an opportunity. You know, mm. nobody's life is the way we thought it was going to be when we were young. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I thought I was going to be a nun. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I, went to, I went to Catholic grammar school and Catholic high school. So, so that's a whole other uh, There's a issue. whole different talk, exactly. Yep, yep. So, but if you adjust, you know, you could either complain about your lot in life right. or adjust to your lot, okay? Right. And play the hand that you're dealt the best way that you can mm-hmm. and adjust accordingly. So, you know, there's opportunity in front of us all the time. Yeah. And I was just talking to my wife about it today. I said, you know, everybody's life, really, if you think about it, is exactly the way they want it to be. And that may just sound, well, what are you talking about? You, the, the, you know, I have this, I have that, I have this. We have the power right. to change what we don't like about our life. That's so okay? true. That's so and, true. And if we accept it, then we accept the way things are. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, is it easy to change? Is it easy to make an impact? No. No. But you have to persevere. And get and get yourself out of this situation. Now, infertility, of course, uh, is a separate a separate issue in terms of. Unfortunately, people don't always have the ability because it's a not just a physical and emotional investment, but it's a financial one. It is. And I am I am working uh, with with groups in Florida to try to get mandated insurance coverage for infertility, but that's a long road. A and long is, road. Yeah. Yep. And it's unfair. So when I say that you can change your lot in life, uh, that, that that doesn't necessarily mean that you can adopt easily because that's very expensive. Okay. Uh, and I, I think that it's exploitative when you look at the cost of a private adoption. And then you say, well, okay, let's go to public adoption. Well, I couldn't do that because, I, you know, we thought about the foster system. And I said, oh, my God. I'm going to fall in love with a little baby and then they're going to say the birth giver is back to take the baby and, mm-hmm. and we're left, we're left. I mean, I couldn't do that. I, I just I, couldn't yeah. do that. Yeah. I, I completely understand. We have some questions coming in and then I have some other questions too that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to jump to a couple of questions and Lauren, I just saw your good news. So I'm going to get stuck a second. I'm one of my regular community members has really good news. So we're going to start with, um, with Bar E Nabavari. Um, what is the reason behind ectopic? Do we know? And how soon can they start a new cycle after a single dose methotrexate? Wow, great questions, great questions. So the the baseline incidence of ectopic pregnancy is about 1% to 2% in the general population. Why an ectopic occurs is typically because of tubal disease. Mm. A prior history of a pelvic infection, most likely sexually transmitted like chlamydia, gonorrhea, that causes damage to the little, little baby hairs mm-hmm, that, line, that line the fallopian right. tube. That's called cilia, okay? Mm-hmm. And those little hairs sweep the egg, sperm, then embryo. And if those hairs are damaged, the embryos will get stuck. So, so delicate. When I think about how delicate the body is in that part, that it's like every pregnancy that happens, it feels like such a miracle. That mm-hmm. those, it has to be like, you know... <laughs> I mean, that's how I think of it, with, with like moving them forward so delicately. Yeah. Uh, how long? So, so we we as fertility specialists often get um, the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy very early, so we get the advantage of being right. able to treat it medically. And most sure. most commonly, it's methotrexate. Although there was a recent study to suggest the medroxyprogesterone acetate might be playing a role, but that's very preliminary. That's a progestin, synthetic progestin. So methotrexate is a chemotherapy agent. 
But what we discovered years and years ago is that it breaks up the, uh, what's called the syncytial trophoblast, which is the future placenta, and, and breaks it up and allows it to resorb. And it's very effective the earlier that you give it. Once you've been treated successfully with methotrexate or been exposed to methotrexate, there is no consensus as to how long to wait, but we say somewhere between three to six months. Got it. Okay. Three to six months, which, you know, feels like a lifetime when you want to try again, but it's really yeah. important to hear that advice and, and try to, during that time frame, maybe take on other proactive things to, to get ready, right? You know, clean up your diet, exercise properly, maybe um, go through couples support counseling, right, to just kind of set you up then for the next time because certainly it's a huge loss. And we always want to honor the fact that, that these are very painful experiences for people to go through. And it does sound like since she got the mexo trexate, and I'm a cancer survivor, I should know these things, um, you know, that she probably was under the care of an IVF doctor. So I do, I do want to kind of honor that and say, like, that three to six months, although it might feel really far away in a really long time, it's an opportunity to use it for your relationship, to use it for self-care, to use it to go through whatever healing process you, you need to, but it's a time for like a lot of juicy self-care. We advocate for a lot of good self-care during, you know, the IVF uh, process. So I just wanted to say that and, and just acknowledge we feel the loss with you. We really do. Um, well, it we is have- a loss. And I think, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that, you know, we think of, of grieving when it's a, a live born and, Infertility patients particularly, but everybody who's ever experienced a miscarriage knows that that's a pregnancy loss of a life that was unrealized. Yeah. And you have all the expectations and then you even have anniversary reactions because yeah. when you know the due date, that yeah. locks in, okay? Yeah. And when that due date comes and goes and you didn't mm-hmm. don't have that child, that's hard. So it's mm-hmm. important to grieve and it's important to recognize that every loss is, is devastating. Uh, whether it's intrauterine mm-hmm. or extrauterine, outside the uterus, like an ectopic pregnancy. Really? Give yourself that yeah. time. So those that three to six months is not just healing physically, but it's healing emotionally. It's yeah. important to grieve. Absolutely, absolutely. So Steve Schultz finished Provera on Sunday, day 53 of cycle, and still no period. She said it's never happened, but the fertility office won't run blood work for two weeks. Does Provera always work? I think that word always is a... I, I, I missed the beginning of that. Why is she on Provera? What was the uh, uh, preceding event? Um, that's not communicated. So, C. She'll tell it. Give us a little bit more detail. Yeah. Um, about yeah. about your story, so Dr. Charles can answer the yeah. best to his ability. Yeah. Okay. One but I do think that that word always, though, right? There's uh, nothing never, that's always in our no. field. <laughs> well, you always it's it's always or never use always and never. Okay. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah, I think those are dangerous words. Also, like, and whenever anybody puts the word just in front of anything when they're trying to offer support, we also push back on that. You know, like, drop the word just from your vocabulary. Mm-hmm. We try to, we try to just communicate. <laughs> Something to remember, though, if you do have uh, the unfortunate need for methotrexate for an ectopic pregnancy, stop your prenatal vitamins or, or end or folic acid because that uh, works against, because methotrexate is a folic acid an- antagonist. Uh, uh, that inhibits folic acid. And if you're giving folic acid, you're shooting yourself in the foot, essentially. Oh, that, I had never heard that before. What, yeah, that's mm-hmm. really important. I learned something new in every single one of these. Um, I am Danny Mack is just a- acknowledging every time, you know, she's trying to conceive, it, she does feel that same thing where every everywhere she turns, somebody's pregnant. It's like, you mm-hmm. know, you go to the market, mm-hmm. they're pregnant. You're in the elevator, they're pregnant. Mm-hmm. Your friends on Facebook, they're pregnant. And, and it is, it's this, it's this bizarre phenomenon of the experience of infertility. You know, it, it, I liken it, I liken it to, I bought my Highlander and then all of a sudden everybody on the road is driving a Highlander too. And it's just this very weird experience that like when you are suddenly in a very kind of hyper-focused, you know, place where everybody seems to show up and, and it, it's, just, it's just a bizarre life experience to me that, that we share that though. All of us sort of share that. So no, no. true love Narsa kind of acknowledging to, to I'm Danny Mac too. She knows how she feels. Um, they're going through that same. 
Yeah, and I am Sharona. Just wanted to to say thank you to you, Dr. Trollis. She said she, um, she chose you when she was searching seven years ago. Oh, wow. Super compassionate. Her daughter is seven. Your daughter and my son should be friends. I am Sharona. <laughs> They're both seven, so that's great to hear. So Lauren's been struggling with um, infertility, and she had an IVF miscarriage, and she recently, and Lauren, I'm so excited to hear this news. She found out she's pregnant without assistance. We love hearing those stories. Now, here's the scary thing that we all face when this has happened, is that her OB is not going to see her until nine weeks. And when you go through IVF, we see you guys so frequently, and that feels so late. But with her history of infertility, should she maybe call her IVF specialist to get in sooner? Or demand that her OB see her sooner, or, is it, or is, should she just wait? Well, the demand is a tough one, but uh, you know, in the fertility world, uh, we we spoil our patients. I mean, my yes. practice. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what we do is we try to get them in as soon as possible, and if they were a patient of ours and then conceived naturally, we still get them in right away. Okay. They, they, we follow them so close that when they leave, yes. they go through withdrawals. Oh, I did. I mean, I was so scared. I was scared to stop progesterone injections because I felt like it was so proactive. I was, I felt like every time I got to see my son, it was a date, you know, and then, and I had to go these long stretches of time where I didn't get to go on a date with him where I got to see him and, you know, hear his heartbeat. And I just, I, that is so hard. It's such a hard part of the process because we do, we get very attached to (laughs) y'all. We do. I think that most fertility patients would like a home ultrasound machine to just Uh see all the time. 100%. 100%. 100%. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ms. Bola has a concern. So she's concerned about going forward with her donor to begin on Monday. Um, uh, with PCOS, tracking her ovulation is so hard. So Ms. Bola, I think we need a little bit more details. Are you concerned about going forward with a donor and you're doing at-home insemination, or you're concerned because you're not – you're not being seen by an infertility specialist and you have PCOS, so you know it's tough to track ovulation. Get, well, two, two, two quick things. I mean, I'm presuming it's donor sperm, right? But yep. uh, you don't know if it's donor egg. But with donor sperm, there is no reason in a woman who ovulates regularly to go on fertility medications with donor sperm injury or on insemination. I think yep. a lot of people make that error. Fertility clinics as well. And there was a study over this past year to show that going directly to fertility medication is a lower success rate than just, ah. try, just trying naturally for three to four cycles before going on fertility medication. Oh, very helpful to know. Okay, so mm-hmm. her concern being that she has PCOS, what we usually count oh, right, patients, sure. right? So then yeah. she can't be using an LH kit. I don't know if you have talked to our friends over at uva.life, but they measure progesterone at home, and it's a quantitative measurement. So she could at least have that kit, but I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be under the yeah, care of a physician. The, the, the progesterone is really after the fact, okay? So when your progesterone right. is elevated, then you've already ovulated. So progesterone is not a very right. proactive. That being said, using an over-the-counter ovulation particular kit is not as good for somebody with real PCOS that right. has cycles all over the place. The reason is the hormone detection and the over-the-counter ovulation predicate is called LH. Mm-hmm. And LH is higher in PCOS patients than non-PCOS patients. So when they are testing to see if they are ovulating, they get false positives because the, uh, urine, right. the urine kit is detecting their higher levels of LH naturally. Right, right. So that that's the tricky thing. So, you know, in a patient like her, is there a kit that you already know of that – can do a better job predicting. Yeah, no, no that's why. Not in PCOS patients. No, you, they really should, she should really, you know, yeah. be under the care of, sure. of a physician. Yeah, and you'll be so, able to, to tell. Yeah, something that I just saw on the screen about questions is that how do I improve my egg quality? The short answer is no, you, there's no know. way to improve egg quality, right? Yeah. But egg quality is always asked of me. How do I know if my yeah. eggs are good? So ovarian aging, very quickly, ovarian aging, there's two parts to it, okay? Quality and quantity. Quality is always based on your age. Mm -hmm. The younger the woman, the better the quality. Quantity is based on two things. Anti-malarian hormone, the best hormone measurement of ovarian age, and ultrasound to count the numbers of small little baby cysts on the ovary that represent microscopic eggs, okay? So as a woman gets older, quality goes down. 
ovarian age testing with AMH and ultrasound can be poor no matter what the age of the patient, okay? Mm -hmm. But the older the patient with poor ovarian reserve testing is more challenging prognosis with fertility treatment. Now, let me just underscore this point. Everybody listening now, okay? Okay. Ovarian age testing does not predict your ability to conceive naturally. Dr. Ann Steiner, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, looked at women with pregnancies who had, who had pregnancies, okay? They compared women with very low AMH to normal AMH from age 30 to 43. No difference age to age. Wow. So when, say, so when women say, hey, I got to check my AMH to know if I can get pregnant, not the yeah. right thing. AMH right. does not predict natural pregnancy. It tells us how many eggs you're going to get if we do right. in vitro fertilization. It tells us how aggressive to stimulate you if we're going to do in vitro fertilization. Nothing else. Okay. That's, I love how clearly you communicate. It's one of my favorite things about you. It's so no. clear. Um, hope that Kind of on that same note, hopefully soon. I, that's such a cute handle. I love that handle. Um, in your experience, she's dealing with DOR. What's the, how, what is that, the best IVF protocol, which I know is very broad because you have to see the patient to know. But like well, generally, yeah. what are some things that, that she it, should be talking sure. about? It, firstly, if we had 10 reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialists in the room, all 10 would have a different yeah. protocol for ovarian aging. Okay? Now, yeah. um, I can't tell you what's the best protocol. I can tell you that there is no reason to go to uber doses of gonadotropins uh, which are the injectable fertility medications, because really above, some some studies should suggest 200. Uh, I don't go above 300 units daily. Above that, there is no advantage, okay? okay. The, other, the other thing about ovarian aging is that there is evidence that CoQ10 and DHEA may improve follicle response. And, of course, follicles are those little baby cysts that have microscopic aches. Folli follicular cysts, shorthand follicles, are the, well, what we're measuring each time you're coming in for an IVF ultrasound to see how you're stimulating, okay? So talk to your doctor about CoQ10 and DHEA, and then we stop it with the start of stimulation. With stimulation, we often do a combination of letrozole and FSH. Letrozole seems to sensitize the, the receptors to FSH, and it, mm -hmm. makes it makes it respond better. We used that protocol on that 46-year-old patient that we published, and it was really yeah. very well received, and so she did very well. I have a 46-year-old patient then to send you from uh, Oregon. Well, let me, let me preface this by saying we published that article about the 46-year-old not because we have the secret, yeah. because lightning struck. Okay, right, so right, everything right, right. lined up and it was the perfect storm of goodness, right. uh, but this is not to say, and everybody out there, I, do, yes. I am not an expert in people in their mid to upper 40s to help you get pregnant. It's well, a very difficult think, prognosis. Right. With your with your own eggs, nobody could claim that they're an expert in that in that demographic because like the the, the, the cards are stacked against us just age age wise. So um, I appreciate you saying that. But then there are certain people who they just in their hearts they're not done trying yet. And and we want we don't want to turn them away. We want to counsel them properly. Like Look, you could go to 100 IVF doctors at the age of 46, and they're all going to say you're going to have faster, better success with donor eggs. But if you're not, if you haven't exhausted all tries with your own eggs to the point where you can move on to the next thing or move on to adoption as an option or move on to the egg donors, we understand. We, and, you know, we, we understand that they have to go through their own process. Yeah, I, 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 that's very, very, very well put, Alice. Uh, in my book, The Fertility Doctor's Guide to Overcoming Infertility, I speak directly to that point about going to third-party reproduction like egg donation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, you know, is it the right thing to do and does the end truly justify the means if you exhaust your resources and do multiple, 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 multiple cycles of IVF and then have your child biologically? And, and, I, and, and probably the gut reaction to everybody on Instagram right now is that, well, you have your baby. But, but what was the price to pay? Uh, right. the, the significant physical, emotional, and financial investment. Babies are expensive once they're born. Babies are expensive when you want to get them through college and get them right. all through that kind of process. So, uh, you know, I, I just worry. 
that, that, that when you go through such an ordeal, and what kind of irrevocable damage do you have even in relationships? We know that there's a strain yeah. with couples that are going through infertility. So I, I, I just pray, and that's why we have our own reproductive psychologist on staff that when patients say, I've even had a patient say who had very poor prognosis, well into her 40s, I says, you know, I mean, how, how, how long do you think you're going to try with your age? She yes. Said, she actually said, until I die. Oh, my goodness. What a and heartbreaking so, answer. Right, well, right, right. So that's, that's oh, you really worry about that because, yeah. you know, patients get sort of caught in the, I have to have biologic relation. And I'm not denying that. I'm not dismissing the importance I can just tell you, mm -hmm. while I will never have a biologically related child to understand the, the magic of that, I can tell you that mm -hmm. I've, I've helped patients adopt mm -hmm. who have had biologic children. And what mm -hmm. they tell me, no difference at all. I Absolutely no difference at all. So mm -hmm. I, I think you want to think about what is your true overall goal if you're not blessed to be able to conceive readily. What is your overall goal? Do you absolutely, come hell or high water, have to have biological related children? Right. Or, or do you just really want to feel life inside you and you're okay mm -hmm. with egg donation or sperm donation? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to nurture? Mm -hmm. And if you want to nurture, that's adoption. Mm -hmm. and, but you have to know your limitations. But I really caution you that fertility treatment is very expensive. And unfortunately, there are situations where patients can be exploited and mm -hmm. that's uh, something that you have to you really have to be your own advocate you yes. have to do your own research and you have to ask questions if you think your doctor is doing something that you just are not understanding or uh, you you have to ask and if that doctor yes. is being dismissive well you have options well, that's it and uh, honestly that's exactly why we have this community and why we have the app because we want everyone to know that in an anonymous way, they have a very safe place to bring up all the feelings, all the things that they might not feel comfortable in the clinic, not because they don't love their doctor, not because they don't love the relationship, but because as people sometimes don't want to hurt your feelings or they are sensitive to, not, I don't want them to take it the wrong way if I ask this question, right? So we just want to give them that safe outlet where you can ask anything. And like you, we advocate before you head into your first treatment cycle, know that the average is more than one and know how many do you have in you physically, mentally, and financially. Know your endpoint before you even start, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that that has to, that, that is so much part of the devastation is when people go in and they say, this one has to work because I can't do another. Well, if you have any discomfort in asking questions to your doctor, that should be telling. Mm-hmm. Your doctor needs to be open. I have a patient portal where patients can ask me questions all the time. I'm, I call it my pen pals. Okay, I love so it. They, oh, they, reach, they reach me all the time. I, I think that if your patient is on board and understanding what you're doing and why, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a reduction in yes. that stress. They have enough stress going through that. They don't have to be led the control issue to me with patients is a very important process. Their control of reproduction has been taken from them. Yeah. And the last thing I want to do is say, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. My style is always interactive. What do you mm -hmm. think about this? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm, uh, I, I think my obligation as a fertility specialist is to provide you with realistic uh, success rates the cost of all the different treatments and mm -hmm. evidence-based approaches to your care. I never tell you what to do because mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong answer as right. long as there's no contraindication to treatment. I'll tell you a quick little story, Alice. I was taking okay. my board examination. It was very, very intimidating. And it was the fertility section of the board exam. And I was answering the questions and I thought I was doing well. And then finally the doctor said, you don't answer questions, do you? And at that point, I'm drenched in sweat saying, oh, my God, I just failed the exam. What, what did I do wrong? I said, I'm sorry, sir. I said, I don't understand. He said, every question I've given you on infertility, all you do is give me options. 
I said, oh. yes. I said, but that's what I do. I said, I, 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 I decipher the information that, 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 the, that the, the couple gives me or the patient gives me. And then I just, I, I, I give them appropriate evidence-based treatment options with statistics and cost, and they have to decide for themselves. I love that so much. And I have to tell you that, you know, I know a lot of clinics and a lot of stories and a lot of doctors across the country, and there are a lot of practices where you only see the doctor one time. Or, or there, is, there are protocols that are rigid, and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, they don't allow the patient to deviate from that, and I think that that's wrong. I yeah. think patients, uh, I think our responsibility uh, is, is to empower patients so that they are proactive Agreed. and involved in their care making the decisions. Yes. Well, they'll be a lot more compliant, too, if they're involved in the care, because if lifestyle changes are part of your recommendation, I feel like if we're involved in, in making those powerful choices, we're more likely to turn, you know, lifestyle change into habits. And, and that's so, so, part, so much a part of it. Um, so we have some other questions coming in. I love this dialogue with you. Antonia um, asks, can she get pregnant if she has a six centimeter ovarian cyst? Excellent question. A cyst on the ovary, as long as it doesn't affect your menstrual interval, uh, should not impair your ability to conceive. But that's not as important a question as what's going on with the cyst. Okay. Ah. So if this, you know, if it's a simple appearing cyst, that's not causing any pain, your doctor will probably just watch this with you. But if this is a funny-looking cyst where there's some concern about what's going on, um, always, 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 whenever you hear the word cyst, uh, you want to qualify that. Is it, God forbid, something that you're concerned about and ultimately, obviously, cancer that you're worried about? If the doctor doesn't feel it's cancer, then is it endometriosis cyst? uh, Or is it a blood-filled cyst called a hemorrhagic cyst? There are all different types of cysts. The point is, is whether there is concern. And if there's no concern and you're not having symptoms and it was just picked up on routine ultrasound, if you're having regular periods then, and, and, and able to ovulate, then you should be able to conceive. If uh, Most cysts will not impair your ability to ovulate. I remember I had a patient when I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, who had huge cysts on both ovaries from endometriosis. Wow. And, she, and she was in pain, and we were getting ready for surgery. So she comes back, she comes in for the pre-op visit, and she says, "I want to see my ultrasound just one more time before I do the surgery." I said, "Sure, come on, let's go over." So we do the ultrasound, and I saw a little teeny little thing inside the uterus. I said, "Hmm." She said, "What's going on? What's inside?" I says, "Look, I don't want to get your hopes up." I said, "But I see a little something inside the uterus, and I'd like to do a pregnancy test." She said, "Pregnancy test? I have this huge cyst and endometriosis." She said, she was pregnant. She had a baby. <laughs> so wow, so we, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So okay, you, I love those so hopeful it. stories. But yep. you know, yep. I think listen to his advice. You need to know more about the cyst and the behavior and what it looks like. So you know, make sure you're asking your questions, your your doctor, those types of questions. Right. And your doctor has to give you the okay to try right. to conceive or not, because you right. don't want to go into a pregnancy, even though you may still be ovulating. You don't want to go into a pregnancy with a medical problem that is undiagnosed and then taking care of it during pregnancy. Exactly. Another one of your patients, um, Ada, just wanted to say that you're the kindest doctor she knows, and she's very grateful that you're her doctor. So we love that. And Ms. Bola, um, yeah, Ms. Bola, just my heart goes out to you. Um, She she had one of those triggering anniversary dates, um, and her child would have been three. So mm-hmm. I, um, Ms. Bola, I, I recently um, have this like health portal. The other people have it, my health chart, and you can connect all these different old kind of records into one place. And I got so triggered because my very first pregnancy loss was the week that I had my son three years prior, and I didn't even connect the dots. And so, and when I heard my child's heartbeat for the first time, it was on my five year cancer bursary. And so there's these pivotal moments in life. And I just tell you that, Ms. Bola, because in the same way that you have a negative trigger, I hope you have a positive trigger like me. Like, wow, a couple of these miracles happen at the most at times that would have been, you know, kind of sad. And and now they're happy moments. And I just, you know, hang in there. And certainly, Ms. Bola, if you're new to our community or new to the Fertility Answers app, 
We have people who can find you the right provider, who can answer your questions, who can find you the right IVF specialist and can help you navigate the next step. Our services are completely free. And we have people who have three decades of experience in this field who are freely available to you. You can just DM me and I'll make sure that we can chat with you. Um, so C. Schultz is trying to give us um, a little bit more insight. She's saying that she's on day, day 52 of a cycle, which um, she's never had a long cycle with no period before. So maybe she's just getting a pregnancy test. Oh, firstly, the, the number one reason for somebody to have a prolonged absence of periods in the reproductive years is pregnancy. So yeah. if, if she is not, so what I would recommend is a blood test for HCG, which is the hormone of pregnancy, as well as progesterone. Because if mm. the HCG is, is positive, uh, progesterone will obviously be significantly elevated. But if the HCG is negative, but the progesterone is positive, for, consistent with ovulation, then you know that she just had a late ovulation uh, and she'll get a period, she'll get a period soon if she's not pregnant uh, eventually. Great advice. Okay. Um, K.L. Muto is asking, can crinone gel, I've never heard of that, cause bleeding? Do you know crinone gel? Not typically. But crinone gel is a micronized progesterone. It's just how it's formulated. Oh, and it's, it's placed in the vagina for, lute- for progesterone luteal support, um, Got it. Which, is, which is supported in pregnancy. And it's a gel, so it really should not be causing irritation uh, as as it is a gel. Uh, so if you are having uh, unexplained vaginal bleeding, then certainly talk with your physician. Okay. This is such a very specific question. So Marianne, this is one of the reasons I love that, that we bring on experts like you. Um, so she had a repeat biopsy of endometriosis. Uh, she said the result was CD138 rare four plasma cells. She was prescribed metronidazinol, if I said that right, and cephalaxin twice a day for seven days, it, should she do a repeat biopsy to confirm that the endometriosis is gone? Okay, so just to clarify, actually it's not endometriosis. It's called chronic endometritis. It's still the endome, ah. endome, but endometriosis is where the lining of the uterus not just sheds back through the fallopian tubes and in, it implants inside the tummy. It could actually be anywhere in the body. So endometriosis is the normal lining of the uterine uh, t- uh, 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 of the of the uterus anywhere it's not supposed to be. Okay, endometritis, particularly chronic endometritis, is just uh, a, a an inflammation, if you will, of the lining ah. of the uterus, and it's okay. diagnosed by plasma cells, these little special cells. I see. And 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 medical studies ha- have have used. Five or more of those little baby plasma cells per high power field. And if you don't have five or more, we don't treat that. Now, ah. the, the first di- the first way that we treat it is with something called doxycycline. But if it's persistent, then you do. Now, if there's only four, I can't really say that I would treat that. Okay, got um, it. And I, I apologize, Marianne. You typed endometri- endometritis, but that's the first time I've, I've seen that word. Okay. Nobody else has ever. That was my fault. But oh, okay. I love that you clarified that for us because I just I see endometriosis so often right, right, yeah. that I I had never heard what endometritis is. So that yeah, that was very helpful. Oh, good. I'm I'm I'd be interested to know why the biopsy is even being done. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the and uh, we 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 do get endometrial biopsies on patients who have recurrent miscarriage to look for chronic endometritis because that's present in about 25 percent of patients with miscarriages. So right. that's why we check for those patients. So I hope okay. I hope it, it goes well for you. Okay. Now, Gudo is asking a question that I'm going to guess is about sperm, because if we're in our community and we're talking about anything swimming, it's probably about sperm. So yeah. if we yeah. if we have very poor motility, uh, what steps you know are are typically taken um, if there's poor motility and there's just no swimmers? Okay. Well, no no swimmers is different than than, than poor motility. Than poor. But but sure. let me that's let me just. Both. Let me just give a little a brief brief tutorial on sperm analyses, okay? The World Health Organization classifies uh, sperm uh, using the fifth edition, and the cutoff values are not yes or no. In other mm-hmm. words, it's not fertile needs to adopt. It's not like that, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So the concentration of sperm, the way they got all these values is that they said they took 100 men who, who impregnated their, their wife with, or partner within the year, okay? Okay. 95% of them had values above the cutoff, 5% okay. below. 
So below doesn't mean zero pregnancy rate, unless there's zero sperm, of course. It just means lower success. So density or concentration, 15 million per milliliter. Motility overall, more than 40%. And shapes of the sperm or morphology, 4%. So if you have zero motility, you want to see a male reproductive specialist. This is a urologist that has a subspecialty fellowship in andrology. We have one at our center. And that's what you should see, not a general urologist, okay? Mm -hmm. So while you can do IUI, while you can do IVF, and some clinics actually bypass the urologist, I think that's the mistake. The reason is that the better the sperm analysis is, the better the fertilization you're going to have. Even if it remains low, any improvement is Mm -hmm. better than keeping it low. So don't skip the part of going to the urologist because your doctor is saying, Hey, we, well, we don't have to worry about that. We could do IVF with even less sperm. Right. While that's true, you want to see the urologist for two reasons. Possibly get it better and you can conceive naturally, God willing. But the second reason is that an abnormal sperm analysis could be the first sign of a man having significant pathology like, God forbid, cancer. Okay? Right. So I don't, want to, I don't want to scare you, but there's estimates of 2 to 3% of men who present with an abnormal sperm analysis they get their examination, and then they find it could be a tumor. So don't skip the urology examination, even if your doctor says, well, we could still go ahead. This is what I'm telling you people. He's such a great patient advocate. <laughs> you know, he, he advocates for all the right things. Please take his advice and listen to that. Um, Jeff Smith, how, first pregnancy was at 22, found a topic, had a laparoscopy, tubes were saved. Is it safe to start trying five weeks after surgery? That sounds kind of soon, two weeks after a period. Well, as long as methotrexate, I'm sorry about your loss, by the way, but as long as methotrexate was not given, you can start with your next normal menstrual period. We usually okay. wait for a normal menstrual interval, okay? Amazing, okay. Um, and and uh, both tubes were saved. The, the feeling right now is that um, uh, there really is no difference of, of removing the tube or keeping the tube, and actually removing the tube reduces the risk for another ectopic, of course. Having mm-hmm. one ectopic, okay, so... One to two percent of general population ectopic pregnancy. Once you get that first ectopic, you're dealing with about six to eight percent for another ectopic. Still, well in your favor. But the sure. next time you, the next time you get pregnant, God willing, you want to get to see your OB/GYN ASAP. Okay, right. because the earlier you detect, first of, all, first of all, God willing, it's inside the uterus. But if it's not, you want to address that right away to avoid surgery. Yeah, hopefully absolutely. Get to it with methotrexate. Same thing for miscarriage intrauterine, okay? Mm-hmm. This, so as soon as you get a normal menstrual interval, try to get pregnant. Studies have shown that the earlier you try to get pregnant after miscarriage, the better the outcome. Mm-hmm. So don't, don't listen to your OBGYN, unfortunately, who says, oh, you have to wait three months or even I've heard six months, God forbid. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. When, when someone's had a loss, they want to get pregnant. Now, I would not get pregnant until you've healed, not just physically, but emotionally. But emotionally. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. But once, but if you feel ready to do, go, then just one menstrual cycle and you can try again. Really important question from Patricia. We see this all the time. We know that there's about 5 million active Clomid prescriptions out there at any given time. Yeah, which is a lot. And she's asking, what is the next treatment after trying for two years? And she's already had three months of Clomid with, with no success. Right, let me just, because I'm seeing on my screen, am I, th- I am 39, is it over? No, okay, it's not over at 39. So please, on, on our website, we have a nice a display, and it has to do with hope. And in our practice, hope means have only positive energy. I okay? love So uh, 39, yes, biologic clock is there, but by no means. If you're 40 to 41 years old, your chance to conceive uh, within six months to a year is still about 50%. So please don't lose hope, okay? Hmm. So the, the question uh, that, that you had asked about the... Um, what's next after Clomid? What do you next? try next okay. after? Like, before, as we go there, yeah. before we go there, before we go, what's next after Clomiphene citrate? Yeah. It is important to know this. A lot of OBGYNs, and I th- I'm not trashing OBGYNs, and I apologize if it sounds like that, but a lot of OBGYNs give their fertility patients Clomiphene citrate or letrozole, and they hand it out like candy. I know. We, we, the, we get very frustrated about right, this, Dr. Right. Collins. There, there is no, right. In a woman who doesn't ovulate, 
and that's typically PCOS, letrozole seems to be better than clomiphene citrate. And if mm-hmm. the sperm count is normal, then you conceive, you try to conceive with intercourse. If a woman ovulates, there is no advantage of going on clomiphene citrate right. or, or letrozole, presumably, unless you do IUI. No advantage if, if they've looked at patients on clomiphene right. citrate, the, spontane- the pregnancy rate is no different than if you were off it. You need IUI if you go if you have ovulatory cycles. Success rate's about eight percent, eight percent per month, and in um, women probably less than thirty-five, after about three to four cycles of, of clomiphene citrate with IUI, maybe thirty-five, forty percent somewhere around there. What's after clomiphene citrate or letrozole IUI? You know, the fertility treatment really next after three to four cycles, probably in vitro fertilization at that point. Right. I hope that's helpful, Patricia. We talk a lot about the overprescriptions of, of Clomid in our country. Um, okay. And Lauren, yes, I'm so glad you're going to call your fertility doctor. Um, great. Another really great question. The neighbor goodies, would you suggest, and this, this is another controversial topic that would like patients advocate for two embryos and we, we like single embryo transfers. So do you um, suggest transferring one or two embryos? They'll likely will do um, PGT. One, exactly. Oh, well, no, you put two major uh, issues in there. You talked about multiple births and PGT. So I'm going to try to go as fast as I can, okay? Okay. In women less than 38, uh, uh, particularly their first cycle of IVF, there is absolutely no justification to transfer more than one embryo. On day five, on day five of embryo development, okay? Okay. In in a fresh cycle, if it's frozen, sometimes the blastocyst gets uh, frozen on day six. Okay, why is that the case? Because we want to deprive you of happiness? No. no. Okay? Because we want to deprive you of complications. Mm-hmm. And a twin gestation is a complication in what we do. It is not a success. God willing, if everything works out, you have happy, healthy twins. There's a 1% to 2% chance that a single... But do the math. If you have two embryos being transferred, I have heard and uh, four babies could result from that, okay? So, twins. Are we back? I'm back. Sorry about that. I was getting, uh, I put it put it on sleep or do not disturb, but when people call twice, it still goes through. Okay. All right. Now, PGT. In women less than 35. So, PGT, for those of you who don't know, is when you remove some cells around the outer part of the embryo on day five or six, those cells were actually going to be the future placenta. We remove five to ten of those cells. That's sent off to a specialized laboratory, and we freeze the embryos that we tested. And we wait for the genetic information to come back, okay? What we're looking at in those embryo cells are typically chromosomes, all right? Like Down syndrome, okay? Down syndrome is an extra 21 chromosomes. So the numerical chromosomes. But you could also detect gender. That PGT can also test for single gene defects like cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs or hemophilia, things like that. Okay, in, so people had thought that that was the reason that we could dramatically improve the outcome of pregnancy rates. A year ago this month, a wonderful article came out by a lead author, Santiago Mune, a wonderful, wonderful lab director, embryologist, who showed that there is no advantage of doing PGT in patients to improve outcome particularly if they're less than 35. If you look at the what's called intention to treat, which is a little bit complicated statistically, but no advantage. In women above 35 who went through the cycle, there might be a little bit of advantage. But really think about that, okay? And if you don't have a lot of embryos, probably not worth doing the testing. It's an additional cost. So if I have patients that are 40 and only have two embryos, I say let's just transfer the embryo rather than testing it. Yes, it does risk the, uh, it does uh, increase the risk of miscarriage. So you have to basically share that a chromosomally abnormal embryo, if you don't know it's abnormal and you transfer it, which we do all the time because we don't always test embryos. Mm-hmm. If you transfer the embryo, it usually doesn't implant. And if it implants, it miscarriages. Rarely goes on to term. Now, real fast, this biopsy test. of the time, it's estimated that it gives you the result that the embryo is abnormal, but it's actually normal. Mm -hmm. So you may be discarding an an embryo that could have resulted in a live birth. On the other hand, 2% of the time, it tells you the embryo is normal, but it actually is abnormal. Okay? 
because it's coming from the outer part of the embryo, not the future baby deep inside that embryo, which is called the inner cell mass. So be, be careful and cautious about doing that testing. So that's actually my co-founder, and one of the things he counseled me about, um, you know, and, and he's, he invented genetic testing of embryos, so this is a really important paper that, that he published. But one of the things he counseled me about, too, is if, you have an, if you're putting in two embryos and one is normal and one's abnormal, it does not mean that the abnormal just does an implant and the other one just goes on to, to you know, success. It could be that the abnormal actually causes a problem for your normal. And those, that's, that, you know, that's like, you know, just rolling dice against, against the outcome that you're really looking for. And, and we see the cumulative success rates of doing repeat single embryo transfers. Be, they're so high these days. Uh, of the repeats of doing single embryo transfers what, because the PGT cycle didn't work? No, no, no. I just mean like a single embryo transfer has better success rates than two at a time. <laughs> if, well, I think you that, the you know, success rate. yeah, I think the reason why the poor embryo may impact the pregnancy overall is that the poor embryo could implant. But if it starts to miscarriage and result right. in blood, blood right. and separation from the uh, the lining of the uterus, it could cause problems with the other one theoretically. Exactly, exactly. So we have one more question to take because we've got to we've got to let Dr. Charles go, and it's getting getting kind of late. I'm sure you want some well, time. Well, <laughs> okay, okay, sure. So what about vitamin D and fertility? So do you is it a you know normal test to to see vitamin D levels before transfer, and does low vitamin D cause embryo implantation failure? No, uh, I don't know of any good evidence that, that vitamin D impacts fertility. I know that it improves uh, pregnancy health, uh, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of fertility clinics will check vitamin D. Uh, interestingly, in Florida, with all the sunshine, a lot of patients are deficient in vitamin D. So mm-hmm. we do, we do uh, test vitamin D, but that's more for pregnancy health. Uh, Alice, be, Alice, before we go, and I, and, and I, and I know that, you, that, that yeah, I want to thank you. Uh, you're so gracious, and and and, uh, and 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 I applaud you for for your advocacy in helping our patients. And I want to just give a, a a brief holiday message to all the people that are online who are still with us. This is a very very difficult time of year for you who are trying to conceive. I completely understand that. I empathize with what you're going through. It's about families and children about right right about now, and and you don't have that. Uh, or you may be trying to have a second one, and, and there's still that, that feeling of pang inside. It's time also, uh, uh, particularly given this crazy year that we've had, to maybe just stop and pause about the blessing that we have. If, if you haven't had this devastating disease, thank God that, that you're healthy. And if you are blessed to be in a relationship where you're loved, that's a blessing as well. So we often look at unfortunately what we're longing for but but it is healthy to have gratitude about what we do have and i want to leave you with this your ability to procreate doesn't define you it is not what you are what you are is what you have done in this world to contribute to your fellow person to make the world a better place 